Great. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so yes, the, the session today is um, being delivered by both myself and my colleague Faith. Um, and we're just looking really to talk about um, preparing for adulthood. So what that looks like for children with SEN and young people with SEN as they move through that system. Um, my aim in my slides is just to look at the legislation, EHC assessments and plans themselves, um, post 16 and 19 provision and, and Faith will then talk a bit more about transition into adult services. So the Children and Families Act 2014 is the area of law that I am um, most familiar with and um, governs this whole area in terms of EHC needs assessments and EHC plans. So I'm sure it's something that you're quite familiar with, but um, I, I just propose to have a quick look, I suppose, at kind of what the Children and Families Act aims to implement, because I think it's really important when we're looking at um, local authority decisions and parental involvement to consider how the legislation was intended to work. So we all know that um, prior to Children and Families Act, the children with special educational needs would be supported through statements of SEN. So obviously the key change in the legislation was to bring in the education, health and care plan. Um, and, you know, I think it says it on this slide here, you know, that the streamlined assessment process, the clue is really in the name, education, health and care. The idea was to bring all of those together in allow, to allow joint commissioning across local authorities and CCGs in terms of the health provision and to ensure that there was that statutory protection and holistic plan that covered not just educational needs, as we saw in the old statements, but actually the health and care needs that fed directly into that. Um, there was also the option of personal budgets and at the heart of the change was an intention through the legislation to ensure that the parent's voice, that the child's voice and that the young person's voice is heard. Um, and that is now actually included in the Act itself under Section 19. And it placed duties on a number of the key um, elements, so on health commissioners, on schools and on local authorities to ensure that parents are consulted and supported. Um, other Things that it brought in were mediation, as you can see at the top of that screen, in terms of ensuring that there was that more collaborative approach and an extension for 0 to 25, which I'm sure you'll all be interested in, given that we're talking about that transition into adulthood. The thinking behind that, the extension of that age bracket, was to allow for a proper phased transition, to allow for young people not to kind of fall off a cliff edge at age 19 where their statements of SEN stop, but to allow them to have continued support if that's something that they require, um, be that in education through an education, health and care plan, or as Faith will be discussing later, um, the kind of transition into adult services. So it was, it was designed to provide, as I say, that holistic overview and that support system and network for parents and young people as they move through their school career. So looking then, taking it back to basics in terms of the definition of SEN, this is important when we're looking at adult services and young people getting towards that, those transitional years, because local authorities still have a duty to provide for those children where there is a special educational need. So it's clear that it's um, an important definition in terms of identifying how the local authorities would be looking at um, children and young people meeting that threshold. So it's a learning difficulty um, which is defined as a child that has significantly greater difficulty in learning than the majority of same age peers, that there's a disability which prevents or hinders them from making the use of educational facilities that are normally provided. Um, and you know, where a child is under five, it's that the provision would be required or likely to be required were they of school age. So it's a very broad definition. 
Um, and we see that similarly with the definition of special educational provision, which again is very clear in section 21 of the Children and Families Act, where it's um, provision different to or additional to that provided in mainstream schools, mainstream post-16 institutions, um, or in the settings which provide early years education, be that nursery or otherwise. So it, again, that is a very wide definition. If it's something that is additional to that which you would normally see in a mainstream setting, pre-school, school age or post-16, then that is defined as special educational provision. And I think there's a real um, disconnect between the local authority's definition of special educational provision and the, the legislation and the case law because it's very clear here that that would imply absolutely anything above that provided in a mainstream school is required to be recorded into the EHCP. And the case law is very clear that if it educates or trains a child or young person, then that is educational provision um, and shouldn't be listed under health or social care, but is educational um, in its nature and, and therefore should be in the relevant education sections of the EHCP. And again, it's important when we're looking at transitions, because if that is still required, then there's an argument to be had that the EHCP is still required. So looking a bit more detail then at the actual EHC needs assessment process, I think it's important to look at this. I appreciate that most pupils post 16 would have already gone through this, but given that extension of the age bracket from 0 to 25, I think it's just important to, to highlight, I suppose, that then EHC needs assessment can be requested at any point um, within those years. So a child could have, uh, and you know, um, it is possible, have gone through primary school, secondary school, but then in getting to college and indeed looking forward to adulthood, it's then that certain hurdles um, are identified or diagnoses are made and that support and that provision is then required. So just really important to be aware of the test um, and the threshold for local authorities to agree or indeed a tribunal to agree to an EHC needs assessment. So the criteria is really clear that a child or young person has or may have SDN and that it may be necessary for provision to be made in accordance with an EHCP. So again, you can see that's a really low threshold. Um, a young person that has or may have SEN. And thinking back to that definition of SEN, we can see that it is an incredibly low threshold and that it may be necessary for SEP, so special educational provision. Again, an incredibly low threshold, hence the importance no, of those definitions. Oh, there. sorry. Is somebody trying to ask a question there? No, I think that might have just been an unintentional unmuting. No problem. Um, so yes, so just to, just to highlight, I suppose, that it's something that is still available to young people at any point in their education, um, and, and they're not kind of prevented from receiving an assessment or indeed the EHC plan just by virtue of age. So education, health and care plans themselves, this is just a really quick run through of what the plans should include, and I don't intend to dwell on them too much, um, just suffice to say that it is really important that they are well drafted in order that they are legally enforceable and in order that at any annual review, when the local authority is coming to make a decision as to whether to maintain or cease the EHCP, the EHCP is fully updated so that it clearly details the young person's needs and provision and the outcomes that they are seeking to achieve because those outcomes, if they are not up to date and are not um, amended, local authorities can sometimes argue, well, they are met, they, they, they've been achieved. Um, but of course, if they've not been updated from the first year of primary school, for example, then we can see that they would be irrelevant in terms of a post-16, post-19 annual review. So just really important to bear in mind. I would suggest that section E, when looking at that section, so those are the outcomes sought for the child or young person, that section should align well with section A, 
which is the parents' input, the views, interests and aspirations. And nine times out of 10 ends up being the most kind of up to date section because parents will often request amendments to their own section. And, and those that section I, I suggest should feed into section E to ensure that we are looking at um, the best possible outcomes for that child or young person. Um, section F and B, so B and F are the important sections in terms of education. B describes educational needs and F describes a special educational provision. And again, we're thinking about those definitions, whatever it is that meets those definitions should be included in those two sections. And it's really important that they are specific and quantified in order that the provision is enforceable. And um, the rest of that in there, obviously personal budgets, we've touched upon in terms of those are a relatively new um, introduction through that Children and Families Act. Um, and the social care provision, the health provision, and something that I'm sure Faith will talk about a, a bit more a bit later on. But just again, to bring it back to the point that if it's provision that educates or trains, then in fact, it needs to appear in section F because it's those educational se um, sections, sorry, that allow an EHCP to continue post 16, post 19. So looking then more specifically at that, as I've already said, um, a, a, a child or young person can apply for an EHC needs assessment and the EHCP all the way through from 0 to 25. And once a child reaches the age of 16, they have rights in and of themselves to make those requests, to make their own representations about what's in their EHC plan, um, to request a particular school or college, to request their own personal budget, and importantly, the right to appeal to the first tier tribunal rests with the young person post 16. Of course, the caveat to that would be around capacity, which again, I know Faith is going to talk about um, much more eloquently than I could, but that those are the, um, the rights of young people once they've reached that age of 16. So looking at planning transitions, again, it's all on the slide really, um, but from year nine, the EHC plans should include additional information in respect of higher education or employment, further education, independent living, um, the community involvement and you know, their health and um, what that would look like in adult life. So just again, something to bear in mind, I think, on the whole, these, it, it tends to be included in the EHCP post year nine, um, but just something to, to really be aware of because it does just open up that discussion and ensures that the services are all on notice, I suppose, from as early as possible. So looking at annual reviews, which are obviously um, the opportunity that parents, children and young people have to review and to look at the EHCPs each year. Um, it's that they're, they're so important, they really are. Um, uh, I think they're quite underestimated in my view. Um, but what we have to remember is that these annual reviews are the points at which and the best opportunity to request changes to the EHCP. So if, there's, if there are things in there that are out of date or if there's provision listed in there that's vague and ambiguous, the annual review is the opportunity to ensure that those are being properly updated, properly specified, properly quantified, in order that then you stand the best chance of maintaining that EHCP and really importantly, enforcing the provision that's actually in there. Um, you know, there's, the, there's some of the kind of phrases that we come across time and time again are things like access to, opportunities for, um, regular, you know, all of this kind of ambiguous phrasing, which then when it when push comes to shove and you say to the local authority, look, you're not providing X, Y and Z, um, it makes it very difficult to actually quantify and detail to the local authority exactly what they're missing. Because if it's vague in the EHCP, then it's, it's very difficult for us to concretely say um, what hasn't been delivered and, and what the local authority are failing to implement. So these annual reviews really are the best opportunity to ensure that those sections are really watertight in readiness for any transitions that are coming up. 
So in terms of the actual um, practicalities of the annual review, so there are specific people that need to be invited to the meeting. And again, the child's parents or the young person themselves is top of that list um, for obvious reasons. As I was saying earlier, legislation is looking to put them back at the centre of this process. So it's really important to try and, um, well, it's really important to attend and to be given the opportunity to put your views across and to make those requests. And obviously, following any annual review, um, there is then the right to appeal. So within two weeks, the school, college or local authority must prepare a written report with their recommendations. And the local authority on receipt of that report then have four weeks to decide if it's going to continue um, to maintain the plan as it is, to amend the plan or to cease the EHCP. So at that point, obviously, um, if there's a decision to cease or a decision to continue without amendment, despite you requesting amendment, those are both appealable to the SCM tribunal immediately. Um, if the local authority does decide to amend, then they have to inform you of um, the changes and give you an opportunity to make representations. But importantly, if those changes are still not in line with what you've been asking for, the changes that you've requested, then it can still be appealed to the SCN tribunal. So it, as I say, annual reviews, they are really important in terms of um, the meeting themselves, but the right of appeal that follows it is also something to be really aware of because if there are failures in the EHCP or you're unhappy with the school name or you're unhappy with the decision of the local authority or whatever that decision is, you then do have that right to appeal. So looking just really quickly, well, I say really quickly, but it's quite um, a, a complex case, I suppose, but um, it's one that I think really highlights the um, importance of low authority decision and the application of the law. So this was a young person who um, was reaching, was post 18, over 18 years old, um, diagnosis of autism, um, developmental coordination disorder and significant sensory processing difficulties. He was functioning at a preschool level. Um, he had been in receipt of a statement, obviously looking at the date of um, the hearing itself, um, and the local authority then carried out an assessment in accordance with the Children and Families Act, so an EHC needs assessment, but decided that it was not necessary to make provision in accordance with an EHC plan. Um, the local authority considered their, their, their reasoning was because remaining in formal education for a further period would not enable Ryan to make any significant progress or um, better achieve the transition to adulthood um, in terms of gaining employment, living independently, etc. Um, and he was therefore placed in an adult care home. Of course, parents lodged an appeal to the first tier tribunal um, because of Ryan's, because of um, the young person's capacity, they, mum and dad, were considered the alternative person for that appeal, but it, it was still in the young person's name. Um, and the first tier tribunal then had to identify whether or not it was necessary for provision to be made in accordance with the plan, um, which led to that discussion around what amounted to educational provision. Um, the, uh, the reports from professionals, so an educational psychologist, noted that um, as one of the outcomes, young persons should have access to a variety of activities to achieve um, access to a learning environment where, where they could live and learn on the same site um, and place demands on that young person so that they continue to learn um, Sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to summarise this as well as I can. So I realise that um, we, we're getting close to halfway through already. <laughs> um, so the, the tribunal essentially found that the local authority had failed in their decision um, in, in three areas of law. So it had failed to consider whether the needs could be met from the care budget available in the care home. Um, it had been wrong to find that they, um, they could only receive specified therapies with a plan um, and it had been wrong to find a plan was necessary um, 
when there had been minimal progress. So that was the local authority's argument that there had been minimal progress and therefore um, was not, he, he was not going to attain further qualifications and a plan was therefore not necessary. And the tribunal considered that wrong, um, an error of law. So the upper tribunal was, was then found that um, the young person could still benefit from educational provision and that the therapies would help in that context. Um, and in fact, there was no dispute about the therapies. Um, it was agreed that they would be of benefit. The issue was whether they were to be delivered in a care environment or an educational one. And on appeal, it was accepted that um, the young person could learn more if appropriate provision were made. There was there was no argument that you know it, it wouldn't lead to lead to um, accredited qualifications and it wouldn't lead to employment, but that there was still learning to be achieved and there were still outcomes that could be achieved if the appropriate provision were made. Um, and based on that, the local authority was ordered to issue an EHC plan. Um, so just an example of kind of the, the complexities, I suppose, surrounding post-16, post-19 provision, especially post-19 provision, um, and looking at those decisions of the local authority and, and ways in which to challenge them um, and, and obviously the success. That, that can be had. So in that case, obviously, young person continue to see, receive education at an educational setting and made progress towards his learning outcomes. Okay, so that's that's my very um, quick overview of kind of EH, the world of EHCPs and education law in respect of um, transitions to, uh, well, the local authorities' determination as to when to cease an EHCP and transitions between secondary school and co college and the importance of um, updated EHCPs. So, of course, do feel free to pop some questions in the chat. Um, and if not, I will still be here at the conclusion of Faith's presentation um, to answer any questions that you, you may want to ask on that. But thank you for listening. And I will now hand over to Faith. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. Um, and thank you everyone for giving up your evenings to, to listen to us. I um I'm hoping Erin's staying because she's she's in control of the slides. So <laughs> um I'm I'm notoriously bad for moving on without saying next slide, but hopefully I will remember. Um I'm gonna speak to you a little bit about transitions for young people under the CARE Act, um, and also under continuing health care um, provision as well. And then if there's time, um I've also got a couple of slides on mental capacity and, and the application of the Mental Capacity Act and the role of the Court of Protection where um, young adults lack capacity. Um, so Erin, if you could just go to the next slide, please. So we'll start with transition assessments under the CARE Act. Um, you may be familiar with the CARE Act already, but it was essentially, it, 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 it is still a relatively new piece of legislation. Um, I know it seems like it's a number of years on, but it was an act that was primarily designed to consolidate existing provisions about meeting um, adults' needs for care and support and to bring in a national eligibility criteria for what, um, what needs are so that everyone was receiving the same treatment. But it, but it also had an agenda of um, personalization and um, promoting independence for adults who, who need care and support. Um, and so there are principles underpinning the CARE Act around um, personalization of care, use of direct payments um, and wellbeing, which are really relevant, I think, to, to transition as well. And we'll talk a bit about the eligibility criteria as we go through. But the arrangements for transition from children's services to adult social care are set out in sections 50, 8th to 66 of the CARE Act and of course they should be read alongside the provisions in the Children and Families Act as well because as, as Erin has indicated they overlap. Um, next slide thanks. So under section 58 of the CARE Act local authorities actually have a duty to con conduct an assessment of a child's need for care and support so that's a, a, a transition assessment but um, as well as conducting an assessment of the child's need for care and support, there are also assessment duties um, for young carers and for parent carers as well. Um, 
And that duty to undertake a transition assessment arises um, where the local authority is satisfied that the child will have needs for care and support after they become 18 and where it would be of significant benefit to the child and where there is um, consent to the assessment as well. So that's called the consent condition. So just looking at that, um, it's a matter for the local authority, first of all, to, to decide whether the assessment should take place. Um, that question of whether there would be a significant benefit to the child in having a, a transition assessment is a decision that's not related to whether the child has needs, but it's more to do with whether the local authority is satisfied it's an appropriate time to undertake the assessment and if you think about the purpose of these assessments it's to try and bridge that gap or avoid the gap between children's and adult social care support and prepare the young person for adulthood so it's a it's a question of judgment really about um, when it becomes clear that the, the, the child's going to have those needs and then um, whether the assessment at that time is of benefit to the child in preparing them for adulthood. And so the local authority needs to consider a range of factors. They need to be thinking about um, the stage the child's reached at school. Um, what does the young person want when they become an adult? Are they likely to move out of the home? Um, and what kind of provision would they need? So you can imagine in that kind of case, um, particularly if you've got someone with a, a complex level of need that, that, that there's not going to be um, lots of choices of, of accommodation for, or you're moving someone into supported living when they've been living at home. Those, those things are going to take a long time to plan and commission. And so that's a situation where you'd be looking at the local authority starting that process um, much earlier than perhaps somewhere, someone um, where the arrangements were going to be a bit more straightforward. And Erin's already mentioned that where there's an EHC plan, then transition um, and, and preparation begins from year nine. Um, and the transition assessment will form part of one of the annual statutory reviews. I just wanted to say a few points on the right to request the transition assessment, um, because if, if you as a parent or carer or your young person requests a transition assessment and the local authority doesn't agree that it would be a significant benefit, then um, the local authority does have to set out its reasons in writing. Um, and it, also interestingly is recommended to set out when it considers an assessment will be um, the appropriate time. So I think I, I've, I've had a number of cases where um, clients have struggled to get a transition assessment and the local authorities pushed back and said, uh, it's, you know, it's not, it's too, too far away. Um, so that knowing that you've got kind of the right to request the assessment, but also that you should be given reasons, I think helps in terms of you being um, satisfied that the local authorities applied its mind to it and it also gives you something to challenge if you if you don't agree so do make sure that you get those reasons if you're not back about an assessment um, and the care act guidance does make clear that the onus is on the local authority then to make contact in the future um, with with the, with the young person and um, to take the lead so not to leave you requesting an assessment again and again Thanks, Erin. Next slide. So what does a transition assessment include? Well, Section 59, one of the Care Act um, sets out a number of things that need to be included. And they're very similar to what the local authority would be looking at um, under the Care Act when assessing an adult's eligibility. So they're looking at um, a number of factors relating to the well-being of the person. So they'll be looking at um, someone's physical, mental health and their emotional well-being. They'll be looking at um, how and what the person wants to do in terms of participating in work, education and training. They'll be looking at family and personal relationships. And really importantly, the outcomes that the child or the young person wants to achieve in their day to day life into adulthood and whether and to what extent the provision of care and support could contribute to those outcomes or, or to the young person achieving those outcomes. Now, in undertaking an assessment, a local authority must involve the child and the young person. You think that goes without saying, but um, um, it doesn't always happen as it should. Um, the child's parents, carers, 
um, and any person who um, the child or a parent or carer asks the local authority to involve as well. Thanks, Erin. Um, when carrying out the needs assessment, the local authorities also got to consider what else, other than provision of care and support, could contribute to the, the outcomes the, the child wants to achieve. Um, and I think the important point here is that there is a national eligibility criteria for care under the CARE Act. And so it may be that your young person doesn't have eligible needs for care and support under the CARE Act, but there are other duties and other ways that the, um, the child or the young person can receive care and support. So there might be um, volunteer organisations, there might be employment opportunities that need to be explored, there might be benefits information or advice about the process that needs to be given. And the assessment should be holistic and be taking all that into account as well. Um, and the advice and the information needs to be provided in a way that the young person can understand. And I think that's quite important as well. So once the needs assessment has been completed, the local authority then needs to provide an indication as to which of the, the child's needs are likely to meet the national eligibility criteria. And that's after the age of 18. Um, but also, as I said, advice and information about what can be done. Um, to reduce or prevent the needs arising and that's that's a key aim of the CARE Act so it's not just waiting until there is a need for care and support but looking in advance about anything that can be put in place to prevent further needs developing. Thanks Erin. So thinking about continuity of care and um, this was the, the CARE Act provisions were really designed to avoid the, the kind of children reaching the age of 18 and care and support stopping um, and having this big gap while um, needs are assessed. So um, in order to avoid that gap, once the child reaches 18, the local authority can treat that transition assessment as a full needs assessment under the CARE Act. And that's designed so that the, the child can move straight to um, the adult provision because the assessment has already effectively um, done what it needs to in terms of assessing eligibility. If the local authority doesn't do that, then it needs to undertake a full needs assessment in accordance with the CARE Act. And we'll just look at that assessment process briefly in a minute. But importantly, until that's done um, under the CARE Act, then um, services must carry on being provided to the child. So you shouldn't have the situation where um, the local authority is saying, oh, I need to do a needs assessment under the CARE Act. Um, and until then, we won't be providing any support. There should be that continuation. And really importantly, under Section 6.6 of the Care Act, there is this duty that children's and adult services must cooperate. And that duty of cooperation also extends um, to other agencies as well. So there should be cooperation with health bodies, for example. Um, just a word about the, the care and support plan and the, if, if the local authority is going to meet needs after 18, then those that, that care provision under the CARE Act will form the basis of the care element in the EHC plan. Um, and so the, the plan, I think, and Erin will tell me if I'm, I'm wrong at the end, but the elements that are, are, are linked to SEN, provision, they should be really clearly marked, but it is possible to have the, what the wider care and support um, set out there as well. Um, as I said already, similar transition provisions also apply for carers. So um, if you're a carer for your child, then the local authority can be looking at um, a transition assessment for you um, and the same sort of criteria. So where it would be a significant benefit to the carer to have that transition assessment. Um, and the local authority think that it's likely um, the child will have needs for care and support after 18. Thanks, Erin. Um, and they're just the points that a child carer's assessment will need to consider as well. And you can see that they're, they're very similar to actually um, the person who needs care and support as well. Um, just one thing to note on assessments as well, the local authority can combine them and I think that probably makes sense in most cases, because if you're thinking about a seamless transition, 
um, it would make sense for the transition assessment to involve the, the child and the carer's needs at the same time. Um, but that is something that you can ask for. Thanks, Erin. So that's transition assessments in a nutshell. And then moving on to the actual um, process of assessing eligibility and meeting needs under the CARE Act. A bit of a flow chart there, which I'm not going to go through, but just to flag, um, hopefully you, if the transition assessment has been thorough and um, the local authority is organised, then you may avoid the actual separate needs assessment stage. But just to flag that support under the CARE Act is means tested, so it may be that um, the person has to make a charge um, and also that care can be delivered in a number of ways, so either directly um, via a managed or commissioned service, such as um, a residential care placement, um, such as a, a day placement, or via direct payment. So that's where um, kind of having a budget and being able to spend that um, to meet the identified needs comes in. Thanks, Erin. So the threshold for a care act needs assessment is low. It's um, whether an adult has a, appears to have a need for care and support. Um, just a few important things to note about the assessment process. Um, there is guidance about who should carry out the assessment and that should be a social worker or a trained assessor. It should be someone that has the experience required um, and there are requirements for specialist assessors um, for some, in some cases, for example, if someone is blind or deaf. Um, so it's an assessment um, the, the needs of the, of the person who needs care and support, um, you, can, you can certainly ask that and point them to the guidance that says they need experience. Um, the assessment process has got to take into account the views and wishes of the individual and must be holistic. And it will take in, into account a really wide um, range of factors such as impact on well-being, impact on family, preventative measures. Um, well-being is a theme that runs through the Care Act and that is anything you can think of really. It is. Um, it can stretch from suitability of living accommodation to um, personal dignity to control by the individual of the way they lead their life. So it's a really wide ranging factor but it overarches the whole process of the Care Act. And then one thing that's not relevant at this stage of assessing needs is finances. So you shouldn't ever be in a situation where someone's saying to you, well, I don't think this person's going to be eligible because they've got lots of money. Um, the assessment can still take place. Thanks, Erin. So the assessment provisions are set out in Section 9 of the Care Act. And um, I think I've, I've covered those already, but just to say that um, if a local authority fails to assess all the factors, then that will be an unlawful assessment and that is something you can challenge. So it's worth um, just making sure that the assessment is looking at the impact um, that the person's needs have on their well-being, um, the outcomes they want to achieve and how care and support can contribute to achieving those. And if anything is missing, first you go to the local authority and say it's missing, but if it's not, um, that, that can render an assessment unlawful and can be challenged. Thanks, Erin. So what actually is an eligible need under the Care Act? Well, that's set out in some regulations and I've, I've put them there with a the link, but the needs must arise from or be related to a physical or mental impairment or, or illness. Um, as a result of the needs, the adult must be unable to achieve two or more of the specified outcomes. And we'll go on to those on the next screen. And then if, they, if they're unable to achieve those outcomes, um, there must also be or likely to be a significant impact on the adult's well-being as a result of that. So if we just go on to the next slide, you can see the list of um, specified outcomes. So these seem quite prescriptive, um, but I would say that they are designed to be interpreted widely. So managing and maintaining nutrition, for example, is not just about um, what a person eats. It might be about how they plan their, their nutrition over the week, how they um, shop for their food. Um, again, being appropriately clothed may not be, can they just, can they get dressed? It may be um, 
can they choose the right clothes um, for the circumstances? Um, so it, it, it's not a narrow, um, pure interpretation. Thanks, Erin. So those are the specified outcomes. If, if the person is unable to achieve two or more of those, um, then they, they will have an eligible need. Now, unable to achieve, again, is not as narrow as it sounds. It, it, it means, can the person achieve it without assistance? If they need assistance, then they are unable to achieve it. Um, or they might be able to do it without assistance, but it causes them significant distress or anxiety, or it might endanger them or other people, or it might take significantly longer than it would otherwise take um, to do it without assistance. Thanks, Erin. You might have a situation, I suppose, where an adult's needs fluctuate, and in that case, the local authority has got to look over a period of time um, to, to establish level of need. Um, there isn't any definition on what constitutes a significant impact on well-being, but there are a list of factors at the start of the CARE Act, and they're the ones that I've referred to already. So um, social and economic well-being, physical and mental health, um, participation in work, education and training. All those factors are likely to be relevant in showing that it's significant to um, the person who has a need for care and support. And there's no hierarchy of needs either. Um, if, if the local authority determines that the needs meet the eligibility criteria, um, then they move on to create a care and support plan. If not, um, then they must provide written reasons um, as to why there's no eligible needs. Thanks, Owen. So if you've got an eligibility finding, then at that point, there is a duty on the local authority to meet those needs um, unless they're being met by a carer. And it's only at this stage when you've assessed the needs that you can then look at whether those needs are met by a carer. So it mustn't be taken into account in the first stage. Um, the local authority also has a power to meet non-eligible needs and urgent needs, but that's just a power so they don't have to do that in all circumstances. Um, in terms of what can be done to meet the needs, I think it's quite important to flag that the Care Act was designed to move away from having a right to a particular service or provision to looking at outcomes for that person and then what is required to help meet those outcomes. So it's not going to be a case um, that you, you can say, well, this person has a right to, to, to go to this day service. It will be a question instead of, um, so just to pick a name out of the blue, but say David has um, wants to go out and meet his friends. Um, so what can be done? What support does he need to carry on going and doing that when he's an adult? Um, someone else maybe needs help to manage her nutrition. Does she need carers to come in and provide that meal or does she need help to cook herself? Well, what, what outcomes does she want to achieve? Because if she's saying, I want to be as independent as possible, um, then the right support is probably going to be um, providing her help so she can cook the meal herself. Now, that might be assistive technology. It might be a carer coming in to, to make sure she's safe using the kitchen. It's a variety of things. Um, but the important thing is that the, the local authority is, is um, meeting the eligible needs that it's assessed in, 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 in some way. Um, and meeting needs can be providing or arranging for someone to meet a service, but it also might be providing a direct payment as well. Thanks, Erin. Just a word about carers, because I think this is this this tends to be a real area of contention. So you'll get a situation where family are providing a lot of care um, and the local authority is very glad about that because it um, reduces the burden on, on them. Um, and so it might get glossed over in the assessment. And I think it's important to be really clear in the assessment process about whether you um, can care and are willing to carry on providing care and how much you can provide. Um, and I have seen cases where families are pressured to provide more support than perhaps um, they, they can, um, or more support than allows them to also maintain their own um, lives and, and, and achieve the outcomes they want to. So it's really important that firstly, that um, 
there is a, an honest open discussion about that in the process um, but also that the local authority doesn't unreasonably impose or seek to impose unreasonable demands on, on family members and there is a case I've put that at the bottom it was CP um, and North East Lincolnshire Council where in that case the local, uh, the local authority was found to be acting unlawfully in trying to impose an unreasonable demand on, on family carers by saying well look we'll give you this much care but we expect family members to provide the rest. Thanks Erin. We can just yeah that's it so um just a few words about health care provision so um children's continuing care provision is slightly different to the adult continuing health care funding um children's care is awarded where there's a need arising from disability i shouldn't say awarded because that sounds like it's some sort of prize i mean you know you you, you receive it um if, if, if the provision can't be met by universal services or specialist services. Um, adult continuing health care funding is assessed according to a, um, a decision making framework and you will be eligible for continuing health care funding if you're found to have a primary health need. So it's not dependent on a particular diagnosis or condition and it's, it's also not dependent um, on um, kind of the, the, the level of need. It's about whether it's the primary need is for healthcare, I suppose. Um, and if you are eligible for continuing healthcare funding, then it's a complete package of care. It's not means tested. So it's different to the provision under the Care Act where there will be means testing and there may be a charge. Thanks, Erin. So how does transition work in terms of the healthcare provision? Well, um, there's no I, there's no kind of step up. It's not guaranteed that you'll be entitled to adult continuing healthcare if you've had children's continuing care. The CCG has to have active oversight of the transition, and there are duties to um, ensure that the CCG is um, involved and represented at transition planning meetings. Um, and Emily, if we can just go on to the next slide. So the National Framework for Continuing Care um, and the National Framework for NHS Continuing Health Care and Nursing Care um, sets out that, that the transition process should be early again, um, should be done at a suitable point when the child's age 16 to 17. Thanks, Erin. And there's a process that should be followed. So you're looking at the child um, child's needs being identified at maybe 14 and then 16 and 17, the screening for NHS continuing healthcare should be undertaken. Now that will be undertaken using an adult screening tool. And that's quite a brief form. So it, it, it kind of flags if you're at the level, it's called a checklist and it flags if you've got needs that are likely to require a full assessment. And then at 18 years, there'll be a full transition to NHS continuing healthcare um, if there's an eligibility. Thanks, Erin. Um, so yes, if um, Erin, can we just move forward to there? Aye, thank you. Um, so the ass ass assessment for NHS continuing healthcare is on the basis of a de decision support tool. Some of you may be aware of that. It's a um, it's a multidisciplinary assessment and there's a set form and it will go through the child's um, needs in 12, I think, areas. So it would be things like cognition, um, mobility, nutrition, uh, medication. And um, the assessment should involve nurses and um, social worker and anyone that's involved in, in the child's care and assess it over those domains. And then they'll draw a conclusion about whether there's a primary health need as a result of that. Thanks, Erin. Um, and even if a person is not eligible for CHC funding, um, they may well be eligible for some health funding. So what you may get is then a, a shared arrangement um, where the local authority are providing support under the CARE Act 
but there's also some joint funding coming from the health body. Thanks, Erin. Okay, um, so that was just a brief whistle top tour through the Care Act and um, continuing healthcare funding. Just a few words about capacity because um, it may be that um, the person doesn't have capacity to make um, their own decisions. And then you're looking at the application of the Mental Capacity Act in terms of decision making when, when the person reaches 18 and, and, and adulthood. And in actual fact, the capacity, Mental Capacity Act can um, take effect um, for young adults between 16 and 18 in some situations as well. So the Mental Capacity Act has a number of general principles, and I won't go through all these, but they're really important um, because they um, are empowering principles, really. They are to ensure that people are not treated as unable to make their own decisions unless it's actually established. Um, and really importantly, that all important, all practical steps have been taken um, to help that person make their own decision. And I think that just shows the importance of um, people being supported and um, their views taken into account because um, assessing someone who's not having capacity to make their own decisions is a really big deal. And, um, you know, it takes those decisions out of their hands. So right at the beginning of the Mental Capacity Act, you've got those principles that are really key and have to be borne in mind um, in, in, in making any decisions. Thanks, Erin. So what's meant by lack of capacity? Uh, the definitions in the Mental Capacity Act, and um, essentially it's that the person is unable to make a decision for themselves in relation to the matter because they've got an impairment of or disturbance in the functioning of their mind or brain. Um, now, what does being unable to make a decision actually mean? If we move on to the next slide, there are four um, parts of that. So um, firstly, if a person can understand the information relevant to the decision, if they can retain that information, if they can use or weigh that information as part of the process of making a decision, and if they can communicate the decision, then they will be able to make that decision for themselves and they, they, they will have capacity. If they can't um, do any of those aspects, um, then they will be assessed as lacking capacity to make that decision. Thanks, Erin. And that assessment of a person's capacity has to be made on the basis of a specific decision. So you're not making a general decision about whether a person lacks capacity. You're making a decision about whether they lack capacity in terms of a decision um, on residence, um, in terms of a decision about what care they, they receive, um, or maybe something like who they have contact with, um, or whether they have capacity to enter into sexual relations. So, um, it's decision specific and it, it needs to be assessed at the time the decision comes to be made. So what happens if the issue of capacity isn't clear? Um, so disputes do arise from time to time. Sometimes it's the case that the local authority wants to protect someone they perceive as vulnerable, um, but the person themselves thinks they've got their own capacity. And sometimes it may just be really, really complex. So if you've got a person um, with a, an acquired brain injury, it can be really difficult to assess capacity. Um, and so in the case of dispute, the Court of Protection is there and the Court of Protection can consider the evidence and make decisions about, um, make declarations about whether that person has capacity or not. Thanks, Erin. And why is it important to establish if someone has capacity? Well, um, that's because if someone lacks capacity to make decisions, then decision making needs to be done following the best interest process. And that's a statutory process that's set out in the Mental Capacity Act. And it, um, it involves decisions being made in a particular way where um, relevant people are consulted, um, where the person's wishes and feelings are considered very carefully and taken into account, um, where um, a number of other factors need to be taken into account in coming to a decision about overall what, what is in someone's best interest. And it may be the local authority or the CCG are making these decisions and often they'll, they'll, they'll be the body coordinating it. Um, but it affects really the whole way that these decisions are made. Um, and if there's a dispute about best interest, then the Court of Protection can step in 
to, to determine what's in that person's best interest on a wide range of, of, of things. So you might get decisions that need to be made on medical treatment issues, for example, um, but also, as we said, about residents or care if there's a dispute. Thanks, Erin. And I, 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 I briefly spoke about this um, talking to the last slide. So this is just the statutory checklist of matters that need to be taken into account in terms of the best interest process. And I think those are really important because it's um, it's quite often that I will see a decision um, and there's nothing to be seen, nothing to be shown there that the the person themselves is actually being consulted. And I think it's really, really important that even if someone lacks capacity, that doesn't excuse making a decision without them. They should still be central to that decision making process. And so their past and present wishes and feelings, their beliefs and values should be taken into account. Um, and they should be asked themselves, unless there's reasons um, why it wouldn't be appropriate to do so. But also you as parents and carers um, should also be consulted because you are likely to know that person very well as well. Thanks, Erin. I just wanted to flag that there are a few excluded decisions where um, the Mental Capacity Act doesn't permit a decision to be made in someone's best interests. So they are things like um, consenting to have sex, um, consenting to marriage. So best interest decisions can't be made for those sort of things. Um, but again, you may still seek a declaration of capacity from the court because if there's a doubt about whether someone has capacity to marry, for example, um, it's really important that that issue is um, determined by the court if there's a dispute um, before any further steps are taken. And I think that is the end of my slides. So sorry to, to, to rush through them, but um, as I say, Erin and, and I are both here to answer questions.